this will be laboratory 78 which deals primarily with osmosis and diffusion it has two sections in fox that you will be responsible for in 2.6a it's a solubility experiment looking at what type of materials dissolve in what type of solutions responsible for Fox 2.6 C but it's actually covered in the supplement in number two so you should read it though and make sure you understand the information in 2.6 C and then there are four experiments in the supplement one looks at the rate of osmosis with dialysis tubing another one looks at the tonicity of red blood cells and looking at what shape they will be under a microscope. Uh, another one will look at the effect of molecular weight on permeability, and then a similar experiment with the effect of polarity on permeability. So let's take a look. So for 2.6a from Fox, what we're going to do is we're going to take a test tube. And we're going to put two mils of water in it and two mils of xylene. Uh, if you look over here, this is the structure of xylene. And one of the things that you should notice is it's this ring structure and it's got these methyl groups at the end. So things that tend to have methyl groups and tend to uh, things that tend to have ring structures uh, are often nonpolar. And in fact, xylene is a nonpolar uh, solution. And water, obviously, is, is polar. We've discussed that a few times already this semester. So when you put them together, what happens is you form two distinct layers. You form a top layer and a bottom layer. And, you know, the question is which one's which. So uh, this is probably the best place to see it right here. We'll go back to the slide in a second. And you can see there's two distinct layers. The top layer here is oil. And the bottom layer here is water. And the exact same thing happens when you put xylene in water in a test tube as well. And that's because of the polar and nonpolar properties. And so what you would see in the test tube, you would see the xylene at the top and the water at the bottom. To kind of demonstrate that, we would add a dash of potassium permanganate. Now, potassium permanganate is a salt, actually, and its chemical formula is KMNN, KMNO4. When we put that into water, it breaks up into K plus the potassium and then the MNO4 minus. So what's interesting about this salt, though, is it turns the solution purple when it dissolves okay so what happens is you put the salt in and only the bottom layer turns purple and that's because the salt dissolves in the water but does not dissolve in the xylene so the xylene doesn't change at all it's a good example of like dissolves in like the polar right so these are polar right k plus right cation MnO4 minus anion, right? So these are very largely polar, and they dissolve in the polar water. But in the nonpolar xylene, they don't want to have anything to do with it. So you only see the purple in the bottom layer. To show that we can dissolve things in xylene, we put in some oil. So we just take some oil and pour it in. And again, the bottom layer which represents the water stays the same but the top layer which represents the xylene gets thicker and that's because the oil dissolves in the xylene and again oil is nonpolar xylene is nonpolar it's a good example of like dissolves in like now the next thing you do is once you have those two uh, solutions there, so you have the top layer, which would be the oil and xylene, and the bottom layer, which would be the water and salt, uh, 
and you shake it up. And when you shake it up, what happens is it looks fairly uniformly mixed, and then it starts to settle out fairly quickly. And what settles out are what's called the colloids. Okay, So colloids actually make up what's called a suspension, and they're undissolved solids that eventually would settle out. Okay, And we don't want it to settle out necessarily, so in order to help prevent that, we're going to add soap. Now, soaps are amphipathic, and amphipathic means it has both a polar and non-polar section. And so, what the amphipathic soap molecule does is it acts as a bridge between the polar and non-polar components. And so, what it basically does is it, it ties the polar together with the non-polar. And here's kind of an example. What I'm going to do is let's just say that the word polar and the word nonpolar here are uh, separate mo molecules. And so what the amphipathic molecule does is it's got a polar end, which grabs onto the polar portion. It's got a nonpolar end, which grabs onto the nonpolar portion, goes ahead and lassoes them back both together to kind of hold on to them. And so that's called emulsification. And you can kind of see an example here where here's water and oil that have been separated. You put in some soap and shake it up, and now it doesn't separate, and that's because of the emulsification process. We're emulsifying that solution. So that's the demonstration. Now, for setup for 2.6, C is um, not really S1 for osmosis. It's actually S2. That means supplement 2 uh, with the red blood cells where it's going to mirror what it says to do in 2.6C. I'll explain that when we get there. So ignore the, the 2.6C here. So what we need is we need to get dialysis tubing. Now dialysis tubing is special tubing that has very tiny pores or holes in it. And what happens is... Typically, those holes are small enough um, where larger molecules, which really aren't that large, like sucrose, cannot go through. But the holes are small enough where water can fit through. And you can't see them. They're, they're microscopic. But uh, basically, uh, we have tubing like that. And we're going to prep the dialysis tubing. And the idea is we want to tie off or close off one end. They make these handy dandy dialysis tubing clips just for that purpose. The downside of those clips is that fairly quickly they start to get kind of um, uh, loose, I guess the best way to say it. They don't close as tight as they, they should and sometimes they leak, especially if you have pressure in the bag. And you can see even this picture, you can see pressure in this red and even in this yellow uh, dialysis tubing. And if these clips weren't, you know, totally tight, it would start to leak and it would, you know, contaminate your data. But the idea is to close off one side with the clip. It's really easy. Just clip it on like a giant chip clip. Pour the solution in the dialysis tubing and then clip the other side. So what you see here is here's a clip on top, a clip on the bottom. And there's our solution. So you had somewhere between you know 12 and 15 mLs of uh, each solution, and basically uh, you want to try to add the same amount uh, for each one. And then again, you're going to close with the clip initially, dump in whatever solution you were going to, about 12 to 15 mLs of it, and then clip the other side. You want to leave room for expansion. Because one of the things that starts to cause leakage in a bag is if we increase the pressure. And if fluid came into the bag and the bag got larger, that would increase the pressure inside the bag and, in fact, increase the chance for leakage. So what we would do is we have five bags. And in bag number one, you'd put 0% 
um, sucrose, right? So that's just the distilled water, sometimes called deionized or DI water. So that's what the DIH2O stands for, is deionized water. And then you would use the 10, 20, or 30% solution. And then also you would use the 0%. Uh, to be honest, it works okay with tap water as well. So you can just get water from the faucet if you didn't want to use distilled water. Um, so we have uh, in lab a 10% solution of sugar, a 20% solution of sugar, and a 30% solution of sugar. And then you've got the two where you've just got water with no sugar. Then you're going to get uh, five beakers, and you're going to put 50 to 100 mLs of solution into each beaker. The first four beakers get the water, and the last beaker gets 30% sugar. So the last one gets 30% sugar. Here's kind of a nice summary of the bag. So there's bag one through five. We have, again, what's in the dialysis tubing. We have 0%, which is water, and then 10, 20, 30% sugar, and then 0%. And then the beaker, right, we have water in the first four and 30% sucrose in the, the last one. The idea is to try to have about the same size bags with about the same amount of liquid. So they're roughly close. It, you don't want a bag that weighs, you know, 20 grams and another bag that weighs 200 grams. But if they all weigh, you know, somewhere between, you know, 30 and 35 grams to start, um, that, that works fine. Um, once you have them all set up and they have been clasped closed so there's no leakage, then what you need, want to do is you want to pre-weight your bags. And what I mean by that is you want to put them into a solution the appropriate solution to be honest. So bag one goes in a beaker of distilled water as does two, three, four. Bag five goes in 30% sucrose. And you just leave them in for a minute or two because when you're setting up the bag, the dialysis tubing dries out and the clips are completely dry probably. So what we need to do is we need to get everything wet and try to replicate what's going to happen the best you can when you take those out um, and measure them during the laboratory. So we just pre-weight them just for a minute, and then you're going to pull them out, blot them dry, and then weigh each one. Okay? The initial weight would be the T0. T stands for time. The zero is time zero. That's the initial weight. And then T15 is how, what happens after 15 minutes, 30, 45, and so on. So one of the things we want to be able to measure is percent change. We'll talk about that later. But it's a useful uh, calculation that gives us sometimes an idea of something when we don't have an adequate sample size to run statistics on it or something like that. So the idea would be once you get your initial weights that's our t0 time zero you start a clock it rings in a little less than 15 minutes it gives you time to go over and weigh the bags at t15 and just go through and however long it takes uh, in practice we don't typically do the whole chart uh, for a bunch of reasons uh, but one of them is the longer the dialysis goes uh, sometimes the direction of movement is um, into the bag and as we move fluid into the bag, it's going to increase the chance of leaking uh, over time. So sometimes we we'll only go for you know 30 or 45 minutes, uh, rarely over an hour uh, to get the data. Now, in the second part of the supplement, we are using human blood, and we're going to actually use human blood for the rest of the experiment, and. Uh, we've used human blood uh, in, in earlier portions of the laboratory when we measured like cholesterol, glucose, or protein in the blood. Um, and so just again, anytime you handle blood, you've got to use what's called the universal precautions. You're going to assume all the material is hazardous and it's going to kill you. Right? Whenever you're working with someone else's blood or may come in contact with someone else's blood, you should wear gloves. 
in class to take the blood we're going to use these little lancets they need to be disposed of in the sharps container we also have uh, the biohazard bag that's the softs we call it sometimes and only the thing that go in there are biohazard materials that have spit urine or blood on it and uh, those would be disposed of properly as would be the sharps uh, sometimes we don't throw everything away as an example there are a few things that uh, you know the pipettes or beakers you know usually slides depending on what's on them we reuse um, so there's a lot of reusable stuff and uh, you know we just want to be careful when we disinfect it so you should wear gloves even if it's yours because you're not sure how good the last person did it in terms of preparing um, rinse everything and then rinse it with amphil or the diluted lysol they're pretty much the same thing um, and we want to disinfect it and then rinse everything and you know tap it to dry so on so this is the one this is uh in fox uh, the 2.6 c and it's really the supplement number two and if you look right here you're going to see that we're going to use nacl sodium chloride and we're going to use glucose uh, in a few different occasions and do something with it so the difference between fox 2.6 c and and the supplement or two experiment is fox does only one of these chemicals we do them both and so I think it gives us a little better data, kind of show that it's, they're going to look the same, whether it's a, you know, a hypotonic NaCl or a hypotonic glucose solution, it's going to look the same. All right. So the idea would be to get your test tubes for this experiment. In this case, we'll need nine. Get a dropper. Right. And actually in, in lab, we would have put a dropper in each of the Erlenmeyer flask with these solutions in it and you would get approximately two mils of solution and you would get two mils of the 0, 0.0 NaCl so what do you think that is it's got no NaCl in it so it's just distilled water All right notice there's no corresponding tube over here right for the glucose and the reason why if you thought about it for a second it would, it would make a whole lot of sense to you I'm sure since NaCl, 0%, right, so it's got a 0, 0.00 concentration of NaCl, it's just distilled water. Well, we can also use the same observation for the zero glucose, right? And so um, we don't need to do it twice, but we can just insert whatever data we get here over here as well, because 0% NaCl, since we're using distilled water, it's going to be the same as 0% glucose. And then we have different concentrations of NaCl in the solution. Okay, so notice the units. Units are important, grams per deciliter. Okay, so we're given units of grams per deciliter. We're going to have to calculate what the concentration of NaCl and glucose are in the solutions, um, and then calculate its molarity. So we can calculate its osmolarity and then compare it to blood and see what's going to happen in terms of the red blood cell size. So if you take a close look at the NaCl concentrations, we start at 0.41 grams per deciliter, and then it doubles to 0.82 and then doubles and then doubles. For glucose, we have the same thing. We just use the same zero over here. In it as sodium chloride because it's zero zero still and it's still going to be the deionized water and then we have tubes six seven eight and nine where we have 1.26 grams uh, per deciliter glucose and then it doubles doubles and doubles okay so I will tell you right off that at least one of these concentrations is going to be hypotonic at least one of them is going to be isotonic at least one of them is going to be hypertonic so the idea is 
uh, you're going to take these and pre-fill them because they're not going to do anything until you actually mix them with blood. You're going to get that little finger stick we talked about before. And in a perfect world, you're going to place a drop of blood into each test tube. You're going to put parafilm on, wear gloves, invert the test tube to mix. You don't have to really shake it. Give it a couple minutes and then look at it under the microscope to see what's going on. Okay. Uh, a word of warning. If you went too slow, somebody might pick up some of that information. Um, but the reason why we don't want to go too slow is remember on a microscope, we have the solution of red blood cells sitting there with the microscope shining up from the bottom and the light intensity could be fairly high. And what's going to happen is it's going to start to evaporate the water. So we're going to make slides where we're going to put NaCl and glucose, right? We have those nine test tubes, and we just said we're going to put blood in them. And what's going to happen is, since some of those are going to be hypotonic, then something's going to happen with the upper body, right? If we um, have a isotonic solution, Right? One of those will be isotonic, so there should be no net change. And one of those should be hypertonic. So we can then take the mixed blood solutions, put them on a slide, and then observe them under a microscope. One of the things that helps when you do this is to close the iris diaphragm. And what happens is you lose the ability to see color for the most part because there's not enough light but it allows you to better see the unstained red blood cells. And one of the hardest things to do in this class through the microscopy stuff is find unstained red blood cells. So that's what we're looking at for this. And basically, this is what we're going to be looking at. Um, So when we have the concentration of the solution in grams per deciliter, we can easily convert that to molarity. And then once we have that, we can convert that to osmolarity. And so when you have an osmolarity solution, you can go ahead and look at what you expect to happen to a red blood cell. And these are images of slide that have different concentrations of solutions that we put red blood cells in. Let's start at the middle. That one's the easiest. So what you see here are relatively normal. They're not perfectly round. As a matter of fact, in some cases, they tend to be more oblong. Okay. Um, but we have these normal red cells. So they have these biconcave discs. They actually could be even a little larger. Right? And you can see those indentations in them. And the normal human blood is 280 milliosmoles. And so in an isotonic solution, you would have the normal red blood cells. And they would look sort of like this. Now, if you went below 280 milliosmoles, then what would happen is the solution would have less concentration than inside the cells. And when that happens that osmotic gradient causes water to diffuse into the cell by osmosis, basically. And what happens is if we put enough of the water into that cell and into your body, then that's going to cause these cells to get larger. And in fact, if you have a big enough gradient, they get so large, they start to burst. All right. So, in a hypotonic solution, cells get bigger or, in severe cases, lice. And that technically would be any number below 280 milliosmoles. 
So hypotonic, less than 280, isotonic, 280 exactly, and we have the case of hypertonic. Now in a hypertonic solution, we have greater number of particles outside than inside. And what happens is we actually pull water out of the cell through osmosis and the cells start to shrink like this. So notice these look like, you know, I always think of them as the top of Lisa Simpson's head, right? So if you look, especially like this one, right, you can look at the top of this red blood cell. And, you know, they, they look like that because the concentration of the solution was higher than what's inside the cell. So it's higher than 280 milliosmoles. And that sets up an osmotic gradient where water gets pulled out of that cell, right? And because of that, there's less volume. So the cell shrinks and shrivels up. So hypertonic above 280. And again, I've mentioned this before, but it's probably worth mentioning it again. When we assess tonicity, it really refers to what happens to cell size. And in a hypotonic solution, cells get larger. And in fact, they could get so large they burst. And in a hypertonic solution, water gets sucked out of the cells and they shrink or crenate. It creates a scientific name for it. So when we uh, uh, look at the red blood cells under a microscope after putting them in different solutions, we're going to look to see what we can uh, expect to see uh, based on what the concentrations of each solution were. Uh, remember, besides the water, we still had four or five more solutions that we used for those purposes so <clears throat> couple things then what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to take these concentrations right take your observation right here's the data your observations so at 0, 0.00 grams per deciliter NaCl when you took that slide, put it under the microscope, and looked at it, what did you see? And really, you've got three choices, right? You've got normal, I guess you could have four. Normal, swelled, if it swells so much it explodes, that would be lice. And then you could put crenate uh, if they shrunk. So... Your data is your data, and you shouldn't go change it. There are errors with data. Sometimes, in fact, oftentimes, there are different results within a sample. So when you look at a slide, um, you might see a small percentage of the cells looking the total opposite of the other cells. So you might have 85% cells that are shrunken that are crenated but you've got 10 percent that are normal and five percent that have gone the other way um, so the data is the data and you just do your best for these observations when you have finished your observations you should then calculate what the molarity, millimolarity, and milliosmolarity is, and then what's the tonicity compared to blood, All right? So we'll look at how to do that in, in a second, but this gives all the different calculations. And again, some of these calculations appeared in lab one, right? So those calculations for lab one, but we said it doesn't make sense to you know test you on it until you have more practice because you're going to get more practice well this is the more practice okay so it is what it is and in, in what you saw um, and we'll look at how to calculate what these things should be over here um, a little later i just want to finish kind of the introduction video and then we'll look at the the discussion video and look at those calculations moving to 2.6 uh 
see again not really uh, part of this it's part of the previous uh, lab but number three and four and we'll, we'll kind of hit these together and you'll see why in, in a second um, so what three is looking at is the effect of size okay the effect of size of molecules on how fast it goes through a membrane how permeable it is and we're also going to look at the effect of polarity on membrane permeability. So to do this, we're going to get eight test tubes, make sure they're clean, ready to go. And again, we're going to add one dropper full, full of each of the solutions. We're going to use a 0.5 molar solution of these four chemicals. And then we're also going to use a 0.3 molar solution okay, of these different chemicals. So we've got all of these eight test tubes ready to go. Uh, you go and use the Lancet, stick somebody, have them bleed, and in a perfect world, they can drop a you know, drop or two of blood in each solution. In real life, that doesn't work. Oftentimes, people bleed immediately and then not very much. So you try to balance that the best you can and, and without having too much difficulty trying to, to see how um, that's going to work for you. So once you have the solutions that are listed here, so half a mole, right? So half molar solution of urea, ethylene glycol, glycerol, and glucose. And then the other one would be methyl alcohol, propyl alcohol, ethylene glycol, and glycerol. Okay. And so the idea in um, the first solution is as we move down the column, um, these molecules get bigger and bigger. And for this one, no, this one, um, this, this one is, is looking at, kind of see it here, um, the molecular weight okay so for the first one with urea ethylene glycol is looking at molecular weight and so it shows the molecular weights here in the table and then the second one is looking at these ones the number of polar groups and the more polar groups you have the less non-polar you're going to be so the idea is for these to mix the solution with a blood drop, put parafilm on, make sure you wear gloves, and invert the test tube, and then put it back. And what you're going to do is you're going to wait and try to observe what's called hemolysis time. Okay? And so the way hemolysis works is this. When we dump a whole bunch of red blood cells into the solution, we drop jump a whole bunch of cells in the solution red blood cells are made up of a phospholipid bilayer very similar to the cell type of cell you study in class there's other things in it as well right but the phospholipid bilayer is where we're going to kind of talk about and the phospholipid bilayer is made up primarily of phospholipids and some cholesterol uh, depending on where it's from so the phospholipids form the lipid bilayer and what happens then is you literally have all these cells that are lipid based and when you have lipid based it's hard to see through the solution okay um, as an analogy let's say that uh, one of your friends decides to play a practical joke on you and overnight when your you know, car sit in your driveway they go and get a thing of ground beef at the store and rub it all over your windows you know you wouldn't be able to drive and see because the fat has opaqueness to it and wouldn't allow you to, to, to see through the windows so the same thing happens in the solutions uh, so we're going to kind of look at the right side over here don't worry about these numbers they're not the same ones we're using um, but they do go up with different concentrations of NaCl. So what we do is we 
take a dropper full, about two mils of the initial solution, and then put one or two drops of red blood cells. Now, there's five million red blood cells, give or take, on average, in a microliter of blood. So we put a lot of red blood cells into this solution. So it turns red because of the hemoglobin in the red blood cell. But what happens to some of these cells is that water, because of osmosis, moves into the cell. And if I can move enough water into that cell, then I'm going to be able to burst that cell. And when I burst a red blood cell, it's scientifically called hemolysis. Okay. The hemo part refers to blood and the lysis, the lysed, right, hemolyzed. Lysis means to break apart. So when we hemolyze the red blood cell, it explodes, it's gone. You don't see anything left from it. So it's sort of like, you know, in Star Wars when they blow up a TIE fighter, right? It just disintegrates. Well, that's what happens here for the, the red blood cells. So what we're looking at is we're looking at how long does it take to go from an opaque solution to a clear solution. Notice all of these solutions are still red. It's not like we did in lab two where you blew through the straw and went from the pink to clear. This is going, it's going to stay red, but we're going to go from the opaque to clear. Okay. And this picture doesn't do it exact justice, but you can look and we'll start here at the left. You can see the letters through um, the test tube. So that means this test tube doesn't have very many fat cells floating around it because it's fairly clear. And that means uh, that uh, we don't have uh, many cells because they all blew up or hemolyzed. Okay. In the second solution, right, we also blew up the cells, so they hemolyzed. And then in the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth solution, notice you can't see through them. So the measure of hemolysis is, can you see the letters through the solution? And this picture really doesn't do it justice, but that's what we're, we're looking at. So because we don't have all day, right, you have to start your timing as soon as you mix the blood and the solution. And some of them will very quick, but typically a couple of them take a while. Um, we're not going to measure more than 10 minutes um, because, you know, one part of the experiment would never finish. At the end of the semester, it still wouldn't be done um, if we were measuring that long. So we're going to say, okay, if it takes more than 10 minutes, we're just going to put more than 10 minutes. It might be 10 minutes in one second. It might be forever, but uh, we're just not going to go over 10. All right, here's another good example of hemolyzed um, cells. So again, here you can see that you can actually see the letters fairly clear through these test tubes. But over here, these are opaque. You can't see the letters through, no hemolysis. So we're going to time how long it takes to do this. And what happens is, again, let's go back to the actual data table. We have these four different solutions for the one part and four different solutions for the other part. So what happens when we put urea into a solution and then drop a red blood cell in it, urea is going to move across the cell membrane into the interior of the cell. And when it does that, it's going to bring water with it. And if you move enough water, because urea is dissolved in water, it's going to increase the osmotic pressure inside the cell, which is going to make water go into it. If I move enough water into the cell, the cell is going to burst. So we're going to measure how long it takes for that water to move in. That's called our hemolysis time. So looking at this chart, we see that the molecular weight, which is a one measure of size, starts out fairly low and then increases as we go down the table. What you typically see in terms of this data is as you go down the data table, you're going to increase the hemolysis time, generally speaking. Sometimes there's a point or two that, not two usually, but one, 
or zero that looks a little out of place um, and it's often you know sometimes people go the first test tube took eight seconds and the second test tube took two seconds so you know you might see a little a, a difference there but we're seeing do small molecules move across the membrane faster and if they do then we'll have a lower hemolysis time or do big molecules move across the membrane faster and if we do will uh what will happen to hemolysis time okay so that's molecular weight the other one is the amount of polar groups now we have methyl alcohol propyl alcohol ethylene glycol and glycerol and if you look at the chemical formula methyl alcohol methyl you know alcohol is always going to have that hydroxide that oh and methyl is going to be the ch3 so that's a good methyl alcohol and if you look it's got one polar group and that polar group is actually the oh here is again measuring how long does it take for the substance to move into the cell and move enough of the substance into the cell and cause the cells to lice get hemolysis i think the easiest way to look at this experiment is to think about um, a couple things and uh, really I think it boils down to this in lecture you're probably familiar with the idea by now that in order to move across the cell membrane you need two distinct properties you need to be small and you need to be nonpolar and this experiment looks at the smallness of the different solutions right and the nonpolarness of the different solutions. So the more polar groups you have, by definition, the less nonpolar you will be. Right? So we'll kind of look at the data, but uh, you know, in lab it's hard because it's hard to get an accurate reading. Uh, hemolysis time is totally subjective, uh, but when we've tried doing it in spectrophotometer and, and other instruments, it just doesn't work very well. So. that's just the the notes we're good so we'll start another video on the discussion